and welcome to the Convex Conversation with me, broadcaster Helen Fospero. Today I'm on Scotland's most westerly island and one of the most remote. To give you a sense of just how remote the beautiful Isle of Barra is, it takes five hours by boat to get here from the mainland, or you can take a 45-minute flight from Glasgow on a de Havilland Twin Otter aircraft and land on a white sandy beach, making it the world's only tidal airstrip. Barra nestles between a continent and the wild Atlantic Way at the southern tip of the Western Isles. And its pristine cold waters are home to some of the UK's finest oysters. The Isle of Barra Oysters was founded by three local mates, brothers Gerard and Martin MacDonald and Donald MacLeod. And today I've come in search of Jerry to find out the story behind one of life's great delicacies. Jerry, it's lovely to finally meet you. You and I have been talking the last year about me coming to Barra. And I have to say, I'm so not disappointed. This is such a beautiful place. Will you describe a bit of it for us? Barra's, it's about 14 miles long. It's about three miles wide at its widest point. And everybody lives around the edge. There's a hill in the middle and there's a settlement to the south end, which we call Castle Bay, because it's got a castle and a bay. And that's where our main ferry comes in. And at the other end of the island, we have the airport, which is on the beach. And in between, we have lots and lots of lovely white sandy beaches and some of the most beautiful Macherland, which is an ecosystem that's based on shell sand based soil. So the, the soil is something like 98% shell sand and it supports meadows of wildflowers and orchids and so on. And it's fantastic pasture for cattle. So that's one of our lucky niches, if you like. You have some good looking cows and some pretty gorgeous looking sheep as well. Yeah. I've got, uh, I keep some cattle as well. In fact, I was looking at one that looks like it's about to calf today. Yeah, we, we grow some nice cattle here. And Jerry, are you from Barra originally? I was actually born in Glasgow and I was brought up in Fort William. But my parents were Barra people. And about 16 years ago, I got an opportunity to come and work in Barra. I took that opportunity and I've been here ever since. And do you really love the way of life here? Yeah, I wouldn't change it for anything. I wouldn't say it's quiet or anything like that. It's just, it's a different kind of hectic. It's not as simple a life as people would make it out. Is it to not? Be. Yeah, because everything's logistics on Barra. <laughs> Making sure that you can get things here, getting things off of here, even catching ferries and planes can be pretty difficult to sort out. So it's a, just a different kind of life and you have different kind of hectic. It's good. I really like it. It's certainly a different kind of challenge. And we'll go on in a minute to the challenges you face with growing your oysters, which are some of the most amazing fresh delicacies you could wish for. But actually thinking about it makes my head ache, thinking how you get these beautiful oysters from here, all over Britain and beyond. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But on your website, it says the business began with a handful of spat and a head full of dreams. Tell me how the Isle of Barra Oysters was born. Many years ago, in another incarnation, I worked for the Highlands and Isles Development Board. And one of the things that I was involved with was trying to encourage people to look at aquaculture as an industry for the future. And I found myself with a group of nascent oyster farmers in the north of France. And the lesson that we were trying to learn was the scale of, of the industry in France. Because if a Scottish industry is going to compete on a worldwide basis, then you've got to be able to look at the biggest producers and say, how do they do it? That's the technology we need to adopt. Those are the techniques. So we went and did that. And several jobs later, I find myself in Barra looking at a beach and thinking, that's not so different looking from the ones in France. The right kind of sediment, good exchange of water, very clean. I think I could probably do this oyster thing. It hasn't been as simple as that. <laughs> <laughs> so but, how did you get going? Did you have a pint or a whiskey with your mate and your brother and start discussing it? Well, it kind of it developed along a wee bit. It started off myself and Martin, my brother, would come up to Barra fairly regularly and I would rope him into helping me. Naturally. And parallel to this, I was talking to Donald and he was saying, well, he's getting to the age now where working in a swell all the time, his hips, his knees, these kind of things are starting to pain him. And he was thinking, if I can do something that still works with the sea, but on, on a more stable platform. So he, he was very interested in getting involved as well. And we just found ourselves falling into this business where we bought the spat and started growing it. Okay, so what's the spat? I mean, okay, completely spat, educating, right, okay. Jerry. What's the spat? Well, the kind of oysters we grow are Pacific oysters, the rock oysters. And 
rock oysters need 16 to 20 degrees centigrade before they can breed. And our hottest temperature in the summer touches on 16 degrees. They never come into breeding condition. So we can't spawn them naturally. So Ah. what we need to do to get stock for our farm is we need to go to people who specifically produce oysters. And the main hatcheries at the moment are in Morecambe Bay and in Guernsey. And what we do is we go to them and, and they take adult oysters and they get them to spawn and then they settle that spawn. And when the spawn settles, it's known as spat. And what you would see to give you the equivalent and with mussels is if you if you were to look at rocks every year, you'll see a fine settlement of small mussels and then the year later they'll have grown. The fine settlement is known as spat. That's a spat fall. We buy oysters depending on when and where we buy them. We, we can get them from three mils, six mils. We tend to want to get them a bit bigger than that. Most of what we buy is about the size of your thumbnail. It's kind of easy to picture that. And we're looking for that thing the size of your thumbnail to grow probably to the length of your index finger. Wow. By which time it's marketable. And talk me through the process because I'm a massive oyster fan and all I know about oysters is what I see in front of me on my plate when I'm lucky enough to eat a few. I have no idea. And they grow from... Do you call it a tiny seed? Seed oysters and spat oysters are much the same. Much the same. So what happens? So you've bought your spat and then what do you do with it? Okay, well, we focus on growing our oysters on the French technique, which is we make up steel tables out of rebar and then we have plastic mesh bags, which are semi-rigid bags, and we'll put, for the sake of argument, say a kilo of spat in the bag. And the bag is a fine mesh so that water can pass through it. The oysters feed themselves. We don't feed the oysters to get them to grow. We just have to try and get them to the right place where there's lots of feed. So where we put the trestles, we try to put them in places where they'll get a good exchange of water. And as that water exchanges, the oysters themselves filter the food out of the water. So from about this time of the year, March time, we start to see plankton in the water. They'll grow well from now till October. And then October through to March, they won't grow at all because there's no daylight. We don't have very long days in the winter. So we don't get plankton, so you don't get food in the water, so the oysters tend not to grow. And also the water gets quite cold. So So what's the life cycle between you starting off with your spat and oysters being enjoyed in a restaurant? Or Well, it's actually quite simple because the beauty of it is we don't have to feed them. So we lay them out, we make sure that the bags stay clean. And the way we do that is by turning them over. So the bit that faces the sun grows seaweed and if you let that carry on that will reduce the flow through the bag so that reduces the feed to the oysters so that slows them down so you don't want that to happen so every month or so we'll go out and we'll turn every bag on the site while we're doing that we'll also give the bag a shake to make sure none of the oysters stick to the sides of it but also so that the ones that were stuck in the middle get shuggled out to the edges they're then in the best place to feed so all the oysters get a chance to feed so we do that after about six months maybe less if they're smaller, we'll take all the oysters ashore, put them over an oyster grater, which is a big riddle, and it separates out the different sizes. The importance of doing that is then we can reduce the stocking density in the bag. So we've always got the optimum number of oysters, but also so we can get them as close in size to each other as possible. Because when they're close to size to each other, one doesn't outcompete the other. And if you leave them for long enough, you'll end up with a few oysters dominating all the rest of them, and they'll get most of the feed so we have to go out very regularly and turn the bags, but we also have to go out fairly regularly and grade them and separate out the different sizes. And by doing that, you always get a top end and a bottom end. So you give the best chance to the bottom end to recover and come on, but you also try and move that top end on to get them through the cycle as quickly as possible because what this does take is an immense amount of time and expense at the beginning. You have to buy the seed and you don't get anything till you sell them but you've got to do all the work in the middle. So really what you want them to go is from that seed to the table as quickly as possible. And all our work is about making that happen. So what length of time would that be from the seed to the table, just as a a rough estimate? For good oysters, if you're lucky, a couple of years. Really? For the majority, three to four years. And for the tail enders, five, six 
gosh, that's incredible. And the other problem that that gives you, if you've got a long life cycle, you like everything to be short, it means that some of those houses are tying up equipment. They're holding you back a wee bit. If you were in the likes of France, where the market for oysters is really mature, what happens is they just have five grades. So at a certain point, they'll go and they'll say, right, this block of trestles here, we'll take all the oysters off there, we'll grade them, and we'll sell everything. And anything that's too small to sell, we dump. Because we need those trestles for the next generation of oysters. And that's it. That's their cycle. And they can sell five different grades of oysters. We can't sell five different grades of oysters. People want a particular size. So realistically, 60 to 100 grams is the range that they'll buy them here. And would that be a two or a three on a menu? Yeah, that would be two, three. That's the two yeah. grades. But yeah. the French, as I say, you could buy a five in France and it's like, how do you describe that in the radio? It's small. It's very small, <laughs> so isn't it? Because the numbers go the opposite way, don't they? Yes. There's a three smaller than a two, isn't it? Yes. And if you get to like the grade one oysters, some of them are magnificently huge. I've seen us produce oysters at two, three, 350 grams. But that's like walking around with a bucket. <laughs> and the job itself, Jerry, it's not for the faint hearted, is it? This is quite a physical job and out in the elements. Yes, it's definitely out in the elements. And we've got lots of them. And they come at you hard and fast. Now, the, the winters are brutal. Generally, we've got quite high wind speeds. We've got, at this time of the year, certainly January, February, a lot of rainfall. And rain and wind just aren't a good mix for anything. So it makes it very difficult. And of course, it's also a wee bit of the cold side. So winter's a bit of a trial. On the other hand, today was a beautiful day. It's one of our first spring days and there was light winds. The sun was out. You're getting the best of the year. You're, today, for instance, we were working on the pier today. We were watching an otter being annoyed by some gulls. These kind of things you get to see. But when you're out in those winter conditions, what gets you through? What is it that makes you so passionate about what you do? I would be completely bankrupt if I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> there'd be no food on the table if you no, didn't do it. it. It's quite as simple really as that. You have to go and do it or you, you don't get the results. It's a relatively simple thing that we're trying to do. It's just that there aren't any shortcuts. If you don't turn the bags, if you don't grade the oysters, if you don't look after the equipment, then you don't get the results. And if you don't get the results, you can't sell the oysters. So you need to do the work. And it's the need to do the work that takes you out there. Because believe me, if I didn't need to go out in that weather, I would I would not be going out in that weather. If you buy the fire with a single malt or something or a blended whiskey or something nice. And of course, you do have to work and respect Mother Nature. You've got to work with the tide, haven't you, as well as the weather conditions. Yeah, we're very much dominated by tides. So spring tides is when we work because we want the oysters to be feeding. They can only feed when there's water around them. So we put the oysters as far down the beach as we can so that they're covered as much of the time as possible so that they feed as much as possible. But we have a balance to reach there because we also have to be able to go and do the turn in the bags and all that. So there is a, a kind of a bit of a balance as to how far down the beach can you go. And to give you an example, with very small oysters, because they're quite vulnerable to drying out, because they're vulnerable to predators, we put them as far down the beach as we can get them. And that way they get more cover under the water more. So they grow a wee bit faster and you want to get them through that stage into a stage where they can be a wee bit hardier further up the beach, bigger than the predators prefer and so on. So you're working wisely on, on how you place things on the beach. And who are the predators? Well, if you have a place like Barra, We've got full seawater, but very little freshwater input. And that means that you can get starfish, brown crab, and all sorts of these, these kind of things that, that predate, actively predate on oysters. And brown crabs will just chomp through shells. Will they? They'll just, they'll just, they'll just chomp and boom. Starfish, they're usually deterred by the bags. The bags are, that we have, we put the oysters in, they make it difficult for them. The other one is oyster catchers. If oyster catchers get used to feeding around oysters, they will just keep coming back and they'll decimate the stock. And there are things you can do. One of them is the further down the beach the oysters are, the less exposed they are. Oyster catchers don't swim generally, they're, they're waders. The other thing is the mesh in the bag's important. So if you put oysters in a 13 mil mesh bag, an oyster catcher can get its beak into that mesh and it can open it. They're clever, but aren't they? at 9 mil it can't. 
Ah, interesting. <laughs> so, Gosh. So, so if you've got small oysters, you would put them in a smaller mesh bag because the oyster catchers have a harder time trying to get at the oyster. And maybe if you've got harder oysters that aren't going to be so vulnerable, you would put them in a bigger mesh bag. So you do these three measures. But we also see, we see lots of other things down there. We see lots of butterfish and we see some of the things like the winkles and things like that. When they spawn, they'll leave the spawn on the bottom of the trestles. And you get wee scorpion fishing crabs. You see all sorts of stuff. Ah, oh, the nature side of it must be great, is it? Yeah. And, and the actual trestles themselves, when their bags are on them, they create almost like a, a reef. It's just like additional reef for them. So you do see lots of sea life around them. And I went for a stroll today on one of your amazing white beaches, minus hiking boots, minus socks, and the little toes freezing, but it was absolutely beautiful. What makes the conditions here so perfect for oysters? Very little input from fresh water. And what that means is that we don't get much in the way of things like E. coli and noroviruses. We don't really get an awful lot of that. So the quality of the water is top. Because of where we are on the beach... You've seen the airport, the airport beach in Barra, the tide goes out by about over a mile and the sand is white and it heats up in the summer. And what happens is when the tide comes over it, it warms the water. And when the water's warmer, it's more productive. So that increases the feeding that's available for the oysters. So we get fatter oysters in the summer. And then that, of course, goes into the, the rate at which they grow and so on. We have this thing where we've got really quite rich water We've got the benefit of not having contaminants in it. And we've got these big beaches that warm it. Well, warm it the bit where I'm at. And, <laughs> uh, these conditions help us, you know, they help us a lot. And you can't really beat clean, rich seawater. Wow, the seawater is absolutely beautiful. And the turquoisey colour of it, and it just looks so clean and fresh. It, it is pristine. I think pristine is such a great word for it. It's absolutely beautiful. What makes a barrel oyster for you? What's special about the flavour of your oysters? I say what's special about our oysters is because when I go back to this full seawater thing where there's very little fresh water, it's a strong flavour. There's a strong salt element to it. But then turning back to the beach thing, because the water's quite rich, the oysters are really quite creamy. So you've got this saltiness and the creaminess. Some of the, the oysters that are grown in in estuarine conditions, they can get that creaminess, but they lose a bit of the, the sea element because they don't have that. But we, we seem to find that ours have this, a nice, strong, but rich flavour. Was business-wise it quite a steep learning curve and were there some challenges and lessons on the way once you started the business together? Yeah, you make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. If you don't make mistakes, then you're probably not doing anything. And then mistakes can be quite costly. Putting something off for a few weeks can cost you in growth, it can cost you stock. So one of the things is that you can't prevaricate. You've got to just do the work. When it's got to be done, you've got to do it. And there are times when, I, when probably in the past I've not been as diligent and you've found that these errors creep in. We thought that if we could buy small seed, it's cheaper and so you're going to have a saving there. But the reality is that it isn't, that you lose more to predation. It's harder to grow on. There's all sorts of issues with that. And actually we've gone almost completely the other way and we buy it as big as we can get it. And that's all about shortening the life cycle. It's all about not losing stock at the beginning. So there's lessons like that. And then there's lessons in equipment. The number of oyster farmers that I know who, like myself, have seen the next great thing. I'm going to use this Australian technique that's going to revolutionise oyster farming. Or somebody in Jersey's come up with a special way of rocking oysters. And so you go, oh, I'll have a go at that. And a year later, you're back with your bags and trestles. <laughs> <laughs> going, well, that was a waste of money. So our big one, our big learning curve, was that we tried to grow our oysters in suspended culture. Oh. Which is using long lines and so on. And that grows oysters much faster if you do it well. But it's very, very, very hard to do well. And we couldn't do it with the volume of oysters that we would like to have grown. Basically, we just couldn't do it. It didn't work out for us. And we spent a lot of money trying to. Yeah, well, you, as you say, if there are no lessons, then you're not really doing anything. Life is a learning curve, isn't it? And and you become more expert in a subject the more you get on with it. Yeah, and there is a bit of comfort in that when I speak to my other oyster farming friends, they go, oh, yeah, I tried that one. No. <laughs> Been yeah. there, done that. And, 
And you kind of go, you know, we should have talked before we did this. <laughs> <laughs> but I suspect quite a lot of the time we're doing them at the same time. That's just the way things are. It's, it's, you're always looking for a way of improving what you're doing because if you don't, you're going to be left behind at some point. You're looking for new ways and ways that will make things more efficient. And, and the reality is that most of them don't. It's either that or you're not doing it properly, but I think most of them don't. But now and again, something will work and you go, that's another incremental benefit and we'll move on. <laughs> what kind of a volume are you talking about here, Jerry? And, and how far afield do your beauties go? Well, at the moment we are producing about 400,000 oysters a year. Um, that sounds a lot to me. Is that a lot? If we were in France, they'd laugh at us. Would they? <laughs> the, Would you the, be small? The, 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 the French, an oyster farm will produce probably about two to three million. The biggest Scottish producer is probably about 600,000, maybe 700,000. And we, we have a French company or a lady from France. I don't know how you well, should describe herself as a company or a person up in the Kyla Tongue. And, and, and they've gone in French scale. Yeah, that's big, big scale up there. And I think they're talking about taking in three, four million oysters a year. So when all that stock comes through, that's a very substantial operation. So where 400,000 isn't, isn't huge. And where do they end up? Whose tables are they our, going Our on? oysters, because of the difficulties we have with transport from here, we tend to sell wholesale. It's a big supply chain between us and the end market. And so it's much simpler for us to sell relatively large volumes. We will normally send a batch of about 10 or 15,000 at a time. And they'll go to Scottish Shellfish Marketing Group or into Loch Fine, and then they'll distribute them. And their name gets lost in all there, so we, they, don't <laughs> go, they don't go anywhere as Isle of Barra Oysters, as far as I'm aware. We have occasional sales more locally. We're not selling a huge number. I don't know name. This sounds a very naive question, but when we're on the beach tomorrow, Jerry, could we eat one from the beach or not? Yes. Can you you yes. can just get one, a fresh one, and go for it there and then. Absolutely, because the waters here are what are known as Class A waters, and we don't have to depurate our oysters or anything like that before we eat them. We can just open and eat, and can that's we? fine. Wow, so, that's no very problem. exciting. I like my oysters clean and I guess pretty well kind of naked, if you like. I like them with a squirt of fresh lemon juice on and maybe a little bit of teaspoon of the red onion and red wine vinegar. And I kind of like them really natural. I like to taste the sea. What about you? How do you like yours? When I'm eating them fresh, I like the, the actually the red onion and the red wine vinegar is, is pretty much my favourite. But I also quite like them cooked. Oh, now you see, I never understand the baking or, <laughs> or adding strong flavours to them. What, what do you like with them? We tend to do them in a, or I suppose it's close to morning as you can get. We basically would put a teaspoonful of cream on top of the oysters and then a wee sprinkling of Parmesan cheese and under the grill. Oh, actually, that does and sound good. When you can see the cheese starting to brown, by that time, the oyster itself is cooked. Oh, wow. Well, you see, I suppose I have them so rarely I just go for them as described. But I'm imagining that you can have them in your house a lot more often than I can in mine. Oh, you might be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do eat them fairly regularly. Do you? Yeah. And of course, shucking is an art in itself. And there's nothing like a well-shucked oyster. You don't want pieces of shell in. That is a bit of an art, isn't it? It's an art that I have never managed to perfect. Have you not? Have <laughs> you not? not? I, I can I can get into oysters reasonably well, reasonably quickly, but I've seen some of my oyster farmer friends who can open an oyster and make it look like an art, really beautifully done and beautifully finished, and you look and go, wow. And then I look at what I've done and I go, mm -hmm, that doesn't look so good. We'll test you out on that, don't worry. Now, you said you worked in aquaculture, and I think you were growing salmon and shellfish since 1986. How did you get into it in the first place? Well, while I was in my secondary school years, salmon farming industry was starting to take off, and to some degree, mussels. But mostly it was salmon around the harbour. And so I, I was quite interested in it as something that was going on in my area that was going to create jobs in the area because there really weren't many prospects in the Highlands at that time. So I went off to university and I did a degree in zoology and I specialised in marine science. And when I came out of it, I just went, right, OK, I've done that. One of the summer holidays, I worked on a salmon farm. And I thought, that'll do me. That's the job for me when I finish this. So I went, when I graduated, went back up to the harbour and uh, looked for a job in the summer farms. And did you enjoy it? Yes. Yes. It's, uh, again, hellish weather in the winter. <laughs> Much more fun in the summer. But 
outdoor all the time. You've got at that time it was it was very much an unmechanized industry, and the scale it is today, it was, you know, it was nothing like that. But uh, it was good hard work outdoors in clean water in good conditions. Just a really rewarding job, and you're surrounded by people much your own age who were going out and working hard after work, go out for a few pints, have a, have a good social life, and then back to work again. Great. Thoroughly enjoyed it. I can see what you mean about the outdoors. I hiked to the top of Havel today. Havel, yes. Havel. It was absolutely beautiful. There's nothing like being outdoors here, really, is there? In a daily today, I mean, if you'd been here any time in the last five weeks, <laughs> in fact, any time since Christmas, it, the weather's been absolutely terrible this year. But this last couple of days have been beautiful. I must have brought it with me, I think, on the... Well, don't take the, it away when you leave. No, I won't. So I'm going tomorrow. I'll try, not, I'll try not to. And when you're not tending to the oysters and I hear you love crofting, what does that entail for you? You've already mentioned you've got cattle. Yeah, I've, I've got a wee, what's well, effectively, it's a croft, but it's a small holding with about three hectares. And on it at the moment, I have four cattle. And basically, I cut hay in the, in the summer, sorry, and I grow a little bit of small oats, uh, and, and it's all grown for fodder, so that in the winter I can feed the cattle, keep them going, and then we get calves from the cattle. And other than that, we have our own hens and eggs, and grow our own potatoes and that kind of stuff. It's just uh, it's a way of spending more money than you need to. <laughs> <laughs> but it's quite enjo- it's, it's quite enjoyable in many ways. Oh, <laughs> and what about fresh snails? Yeah, See, fresh I've been snails. digging There's, deep, Jerry. I know all about have. you. Yeah, fresh snails. Well, there's another story. <laughs> In my pre barra days, when I used to come up, one of the things I noticed about the place was that there are a lot of snails in Barra. You might not see them just now because it's only March, but there's a lot of snails. And this, going back to the macker thing, this sandy, high calcium soil really lends itself to snails. So, made some inquiries and discovered that. Every snail that lives in the United Kingdom is edible. This, most of them are too small to bother with. And that was interesting. And I thought, well, maybe somebody will eat these snails. And it took me probably 20 years to find somebody who would. Uh, but I, I finally managed to get a hold of, of a guy in a, in a restaurant in Edinburgh, a guy called Fred Bertmuller. And he's French. And he has a restaurant, or at that time he had the restaurant, it was a Escargot Blue and he's now got a scargle bloke as well. And Fred said, yeah, I'll take you your snails. How many can you give me? And I went, well, what do you want? And he goes, can I have 10 kilos a week? 10 kilos a week of snails? T- 10 kilos a lot of snails. That's a lot of That's snails. Buckets of snails, that is. But we managed to do them 10 kilos a week for a while. Did you really? Uh, but it, you have to go on with other parts of your life as well. There's a lot of time picking 10 kilos of snails. So we've cut it back a bit since then. But... We still sell snails to, to Fred occasionally. And we also sell to uh, the Three Chimneys restaurant in Sky, which is you know, quite a well-known, high-quality food restaurant there. But the interesting story with snails in Barra is that how they got here. Because the, the first story I heard about it was that they were they got here with the Romans. That's got to be rubbish because the Romans never got here. So it can't be that. And then the next part of the story, I went, well, they've got to come from somewhere. And we did some research. And eventually it turns out that when the monks came, the first religious people came to the islands, they brought snails with them. And they brought snails with them for quite good reasons. One of them is that they hibernate. So you can get these snails, collect them in, in the autumn. And they're really self-contained tins of food. You know, there's, there's a wee just food in a shell that goes to sleep for the winter. And it doesn't matter if it's asleep or not, you can just take it out and cook it and eat it. The other thing is that snails weren't counted as meat. So on fast days, when they weren't allowed to eat meat, they could eat snails. So they could still have something fairly substantial. And at times when you couldn't get out and fish, snails were there. So there was this food that was available through the winter, if you went and collected it in the summer. And it could be eaten on days when other foods couldn't be eaten. So that was where we believe that snails got to batter from. And on places like Tyree and Uist, but not South Uist. Gosh. Because South Uist's got hedgehogs. Has it? And the hedgehogs eat the snails. Selling barra snails to, to effectively the French. Yes. That's, that's quite special about that. Will we be eating a snail tomorrow, just checking? No. No, no, no snails tomorrow. Shall we, stick to, shall we stick to oysters? I think that'll be wise. 
When I first asked you to do the podcast, Jerry, um, you asked whether I thought you'd be interesting enough and you seemed quite shocked that I'd asked you to feature on the podcast series. It's been absolutely fascinating talking oysters to you and thank you for having me today and for and for sharing the story with me and uh, and for letting me taste them. All right, well, thank you. It's very nice to be involved. You've been listening to Jerry McDonald, one of the founding directors of the Isle of Barra Oysters, giving us an insight into how oysters are grown and nurtured here in the Outer Hebrides and, in fact, how snails came to the Isle of Barra. Download and subscribe to our series at convex.podbean.com or search The Convex Conversation on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple and Google Podcasts or wherever you listen to yours. I'll be back next week, sadly not sampling fine oysters, but with another fascinating guest. So join me then. Thank you.